I just feel like I'm working in an area with, with trap doors lying in ways. Because, um, I've got uh, figurative. I don't like figurative, but I'm often called that because I don't think I'm a narrative figurative artist. If you're labelled as that in this country, there is a second-rate feel to it. It's not accepted by the art establishment. And, you know, you wouldn't... The thing is, you wouldn't call Francis Bacon... Uh, the figurative artists. You wouldn't call the Chapman brothers figurative, but they deal with figures. And someone wrote to me and said, oh, they heard I was a watercolourist. And I winced, you know. <laughs> I thought, this is everything I'm against, everything I don't want to be thought of. You know, you can get an image of uh, someone doing very small paintings of boats. Or, well, I did boats, so no, I can't say that. Of flowers or, you know, whatever. I'm sort of the opposite. I've tried to reinvent it and uh, give it muscle, really. If someone said to me, oh, uh, you do nudes, don't you? Well, that, that's horrendous. I, I get an image in my head, it's not me. I've always felt they occupy their own territory and they cease being naked, unless that's my intention, of course. Then I'm after something else, but I suppose night swimming would uh, be in that category, or not, also perhaps Ember. But say the Slow Burn series, that's different, that would be about sensuality, and I'm after something else in that case. The figures are made up. I mean, I'm not after figures as such. They haven't got names to them. They never do. They're all anonymous. And it, it, uh, uh, I'll never use the expression uh, every man or anything like that. But I'm after an emotive feeling that other people can refer to and maybe have common ground with. That's ultimately what I'm after. And they, uh, by that, they do jump countries. I mean, that's the uh, great asset. You know, people from Russia have come up to me and said my work touches them as much as, you know, any country around the world, really. With watercolours, Dean was able to put the brilliance of his expressive figure-motivated colour gestures on washi paper. Yeah. I know it's supposed to be very good, but it's good for calligraphy and very wet paint. Yeah, it's like blotting it's paper. It's not good yeah. for... Uh, and it's like blotting yeah. paper. And you, and you can't... If you, if, you, if you work on it too much, it roughs up. So you've got to be very quick and very calligraphic. You can't, which is you what, can't erase. No, which is what the Japanese method is. It's very calligraphic, very... You've got to be confident in but your mind. But they don't care. I don't struggle over titles, but I give a lot of thought to titles. I've got... I, I keep whole books of words, you know, words I like, and, uh, and I think, can I make this into a title? Like Fragile Lessons, I mean, I struggled over that one until something clicked, and oh, that, that's right. A lot of artists get dreadful titles for the work, or they have untitled. This is a cop out, you know. Mm. But no, I mean, my, I'm pretty pleased with a lot of my titles. I've got Straight to Red, or Light Sweet Crude. That was a good one. That was just a phrase I liked. And I was in a, a German hotel just watching the news, and they said, "Oh, the price of Light Sweet Crude today has gone down." Uh, what, what is Light? I have no idea what Light Sweet Crude is. And of course, it's an oil. But I, uh, then people went talking about oil prices, and I just picked up the phrase. And I thought, in a way, that sums up a lot of my work, light, sweet, crude. You know, those three words could sum up a lot. So I used that one. Thinking bodies, white noise, straight to red. Yeah, yeah they're OK titles. Sometimes the, the titles come before the painting. Sometimes after, sometimes before, but, but that can help. It can help. It's a, it, I always think a title's a rudder, and you can steer someone's perception of a work. So they're looking at it, and you can just get the emotions in the right, tilting the right way, really. We've got a new studio in Umbria, and that's just finished, so uh, 
I'll be working there in the future, but I've only done small work there at present. That's wonderful. It's so tranquil. It's the most tranquil space I've ever had. It's a bit like a chapel. It's a conversion, but it's actually very much like a chapel, extremely high ceilings. But that seems appropriate to me because art is probably my only religion, so I've ended up in the chapel. The house and the studio are encircled by a river. Literally, the river goes around this, and um, uh, maybe I'm wrong in this, but I've been told it's quite zen-like to have that. So it's like a horseshoe, apparently inverted horseshoe is quite zen-like. But that could explain why it's so goddamn tranquil. I mean, I just sit there and I'm, I'm instantly happy, you know, I, and I, I've got views straight down the valley. It's, um, it's bliss. I have this ritual um, every morning when I'm there, and I, I go down really early, a bit like Brighton, I go really early, and I go and sweep the terrace. And I really get into this. this you know, the, the sun's rising, I'm sweeping. But I've often thought I should take up yoga and uh, maybe do bad positions. Or, but uh, it, 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 the situation would be absolutely ideal for that. I don't know what they're all called, the dead dog rising or something. I, I'm not too sure. <laughs> On the studio terrace, I've built in a, a very long bench seat into the wall. And I was lying down there one morning, it, was, it must have been only about 6.30. I was just listening to the noises and I must have fallen asleep. And uh, I woke up and, and the sky, I remember the sky being that really deep cold body blue which you can get there. But I've got telegraph wires going across, and there were about 50 to 100 birds on these wires. And I just looked, and it was so similar to a painting I'd recently done, bird boat picture. And again, it was a bit like a slide that suddenly dropped into my head, you know, but I was actually looking at this thing. And I thought, oh, damn, I haven't got my camera, you know, and I was just, and I couldn't move because I, they would have gone. And they, they were like jet black against the blue, absolutely marvellous. So I went back every morning then for five days, same time, not one appeared, or maybe one or two appeared, and that was it. I was so pissed off. <laughs> well, I've thought about this lately, whether the location is part of the work. I rarely use landscape in my work, but the, um, the placement of the figures is really important. And that uh, might seem a bit ludicrous, but I'm sure if I worked with a model in the studio in Umbria, it'd be really different to the one in Brighton. Even though it might be against a, you know, a blank background, there'd be a different feel coming in. And I, I think this idea of landscape's going to creep in a bit more as time goes on. And the more time I spend down there, in Umbria, it certainly will. At the moment, I'm, I'm just getting used to the sounds. The sounds are enough to... I'm, I'm an urban boy, you know, these... There's some strange sounds going on over there. Being in the country is like an anathema, or certainly was until I bought this place. And I'm used to urban noises. I understand all those. I don't get worried about sirens or footsteps or you name it. But listening to... A sort of alien sounds at night there. I thought, oh my God, what is that, you know? Sometimes you're sitting there and you'll hear this buzzing roar. Or and you, you don't want to turn around. You think, what the hell is this? And it's a gigantic flying black thing. <laughs> you just, my God, what is that? You can't, you know, you can't think this thing can fly. I call it now acceptable noise. You know, it's, it's a pleasant noise. Sometimes, I th think sometimes it's louder than, than urban noise, but for some reason it's acceptable to the ear, which uh, a siren or you know, a car alarm really isn't. The crickets are really, really loud. And I was trying to record one recently, and I, it was so loud, unbelievably loud. And I kept creeping up, and I got so far, and he stopped, you know. <laughs> I thought, you bugger. <laughs> and I was all over to my mic. You know, you and I didn't move, and he, he must have known I was like, he wouldn't start up again, you know. But it's amazing um, noise, and it, it's, it seems to echo around the valley.